Good evening, everyone. My name is Patrice Rankin, and from the way I'm dressed, most of you who know me might think that my failure tonight is a wardrobe failure. <laughs> I dress this way to highlight one of the things that I want to talk about. I want to frame a composition in three parts to talk about what my failure is. The first part is one of my existence, my being, and ex what I might call an existential failure. The second part is something I did, and the third part is something that I failed to do. So on the side of the existence, the existential failure, my failure, to some extent, as I perceive it at times, is that of being a black man in America. Now, I know that's going to sound to a lot of people as though I'm downgrading my heritage, my existence, that's not what I mean. I want to make it really clear that I am extremely proud of my legacy as an African American. I come from a long line of achievers, writers like Phyllis Wheatley, who wrote poetry and slavery and learned Latin in that condition, Frederick Douglass, the great orator, novelists like Toni Morrison and Ralph Ellison. I could go on and on. Also, what you see is not what you get. You're looking at a black man, but you're also looking at a man whose heritage includes Native American, to some extent uh, Caribbean, also Syrian Jew in my heritage, and my last name is, after all, Rankin, so there's some Scottish-Irish in there somewhere. <laughs> but at the same time, to be an African-American in America is to be, at least in my perception at times, connected with this hoodie with young men like Trayvon Martin, shot down uh, in the streets of Florida, men like Michael Brown, Tamir Rice in Ohio, and on and on and on. In other words, to be a black man in America, to be black in America at times, is to be part of a landscape of failure, a landscape in which we are born, in which at times we are expected or expect ourselves to fail. This point was really driven home to me recently when I was in New York, my place of birth. I went to New York in January to visit my last remaining grandparent, my grandmother on my mother's side, who was in a nursing home in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn. Now, Cobble Hill is on the southeast side, or rather the southwest side of Brooklyn, all the way over toward the piers. And I was jogging toward this nursing home from my, uh, my hotel room. And if you know anything about me, you know that I'm also directionally challenged. I can get lost on this stage. <laughs> so I'm jogging to Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, and I end up in Red Hook, Brooklyn, which is further southwest, right at the dock. Now, when I was a little kid, Red Hook, Brooklyn, was one of those places where we knew never to go. It was a place where, in my church in Brooklyn Tabernacle, the pastor would always talk about sending his prayer warriors to this neighborhood. This was a place full of drug addicts, full of prostitutes, full of all the negative parts of our existence that you can think of all in that neighborhood. And I'm jogging to get to Cobble Hill, and there I am, ended up in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Now, Red Hook is not what it used to be. As you know, maybe, uh, Brooklyn is very gentrified at this stage. Uh, the neighborhood is very mixed, but it's still not the affluence of Cobble Hill. Not a mile and a half away in Cobble Hill, where there are brownstones, where I walk down the street and people don't even move out of your way, you're invisible in some regards. There I was in Red Hook, Cobble Hill, and it struck me as I was looking at my Google Maps that as I looked up was the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, separating poor from rich, separating black from white, brown from white, high from low, the landscape of American society. This is the baggage into which I'm born. It's the baggage into which I found myself. In 1992, when I went off to graduate school, I realized that we were leaving uh, on, all the way on the east side now, East Flatbush. I was leaving to go to graduate school at Yale University, and that neighborhood actually saw real estate agencies burnt down in 1992 in Canarsie, Brooklyn, when I was going off to grad school, because those agents had sold homes to African-American families. My family had migrated from Jamaica into those neighborhoods. We were, at the time, one of the first families in those neighborhoods. They used to be Italian. They, at some point, they were Jewish. 
and now they were becoming Caribbean. And those neighborhoods had reached the tipping point that we know to be around 15% where white flight happens, where people begin to leave those neighborhoods. And this person felt the need to burn down this real estate agency because blacks were going to be moving into that neighborhood. That's the baggage I, I had going off to grad school in 1992. These experiences inspired fear in me. They inspired a sense of doubt in me, a sense of self-doubt. And to some extent, late, recently we heard uh, Tanaisi Coates, uh, Tanahasi Coates, the journalist, talk about how growing up, the fear of violence was part of his experience. It was indelible. It was part of how he saw his life going to school, to and from, avoiding incident, avoiding conflict, avoiding violence. You know, sometimes whites look at blacks and feel fear. As a black man, I experienced this fear as well. I went through these neighborhoods, these experiences, and had fear as part of who I was and how I was growing up. Despite the fact that I came from a middle-class family, hard-working family, and was able to go off to graduate school at Yale University. So that's the existential. That's the framework for which this condition uh, of race in America struck me, framed my experience. Fast forward now to graduate school, first two years of graduate school between 1992 and 1994. I am in my first years and I experience a breakup. I was dating a woman and we broke up and I was really devastated. I uh, got in my car, drove off from New Haven, Connecticut to West Haven because there was a beach there and like most of us, if there's a beach nearby and you want to clear your mind, you go to the shore and you uh, spend some time there and clear your mind. I parked. I didn't know that I had parked illegally. The mistake there was parking illegally. I parked, went to the beach, started walking around, and in a very short time, a police officer pulls up next to me. I look around and notice that the police officer is there, and I go over to him, and we now begin the normal ritual that many people in this room has, have experienced. I pull out my license, I pull out my registration, I give those to him, and again, think of my background and my own feelings. This is a white officer, he's armed, I'm unarmed, I'm by myself, there's no one else on the beach, and again, that fear wells up inside of me. But I want to let this man know, I'm not one of those Negroes. You can laugh. <laughs> I am not one of the young black men he thinks I am. I'm a graduate student at Yale University. I'm about to get my PhD. So I pull out my Yale ID to show him that I'm not one of those, right? <laughs> he looks at the Yale license, or the Yale ID, and he says, you know, takes a pause and says, you know, my father, whom I love, went to Harvard. <laughs> You're with me. <laughs> And he says, following, he says, and my ex-wife, whom I loathe, went to Yale. <laughs> we laugh now, but I was so petrified. I did not know what this man had for me, what I had done to inspire this reaction from him. He had not at this point even told me why he pulled me over. There I am sitting, you know, and maybe he did just hate Yaleys. Maybe he did have a terrible ex-wife. I don't know. Maybe he needed a beer summit. But there I was, and uh, with this cop, feeling this fear, he goes off, and he spends what feels like an eternity. It was probably no more than 20 minutes, but it felt like forever. I sat there, waited, fear welling up inside of me, thinking that I was not going to make it out of the situation alive, not knowing what this man was going to do to me. One of those. So I wait and wait. He comes back, and he gives me a ticket. That ticket was not paid for five years. I was so hurt by this experience that the ticket rested. There was a court date. I never went. The ticket rested on my desk. I lost my Connecticut license. When I moved back to New York a couple of years later, I was able to get a New York license. But then when I finally went to my first job at Purdue University in Lafayette, Indiana, and they needed me to have uh, the Connecticut license bill paid in order to get an Indiana license. So five years that ticket sat, five years that summons stayed unpaid, and finally five years later I was able to face this experience that I had gone through and renew my license and pay the fine. Five years, that's the experience. It scarred me, my mistake was parking illegally. Again, think of that existential frame, think of how I'm experiencing these things, those first two years in grad school, now I'm sitting in class, I'm not even sure how much time had passed between being stopped by the cop, 
and being in this graduate school, in this class, I don't know, I can't say for sure that my classmates didn't have similar experiences, but it certainly felt like I was the one having these experiences and they weren't. There I was in class, sat there, I had an exam uh, a presentation to give, uh, an oral presentation in that class. It was actually on a topic called the second sophistic. I was to give a paper on this rebirth of Greek philosophy in the second century AD under the Roman Empire. Yale is a school where people were still writing their dissertations in Latin at the time. And I was studying classical languages and literature. I was at the height of this university. I was at one of the top um, uh, disciplines in this university. There I was in class to give this presentation and I absolutely froze, I, I failed. I sat there with my classmates, was about to give this presentation, had prepared, was so ready, and I just froze. Again, these experiences shaped me, they made me who I was, they, in that situation, they culminated in ongoing fear, ongoing self-doubt, ongoing inability at times to perform. I want to leave you in that uh, last and third failure with a quote. This is a quote from Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. I am an invisible man. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bones, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. What do I see when I look in the mirror? What do you see when you look at me?